Hi everyone, I'm Chris. Um, I'm an engineer at Advis. I'm also a co-organizer of the Cassandra DC Meetup. And like all meetup organizers, I'm always looking for speakers. So if you're uh, ever in DC, feel free to stop by and say hi. And if you'd like to talk to a wider group, that would be great too. Uh, there's a bunch of contact information um, for me. If you want to uh, you know, tweet me, send me an email, or just I'll be around the rest of the day if you have any questions. And feel free to interrupt me uh, if I say something that, that doesn't make too much sense. So we're talking about uh, first Cassandra at this, uh, at, at this. What do we use Cassandra for? Why do we use it? Uh, kind of provide the context for the rest of the talk. Um, then we're talking about ZFS. And then a quick show of hands. How many people have like heard of ZFS or sort of know what it is? Okay, cool. Uh, how many people use uh, ZFS in production? And is that production operating system Linux? Okay, thank you. That help, helps me a lot for the rest of the talk. Um, then we're talking about how we use ZFS to sort of scale up, get more efficiency uh, per physical compute node. And also, uh, sort of skip down, so to speak, handle our uh, smaller clusters uh, more efficiently with multi tenancy. Um, so, this is, is Add This. We make a suite of tools uh, for publishers to put on the web page, and that includes everything from uh, relatively static uh, sort of social sharing buttons, uh, showed to Facebook or Twitter, whatever it's cool, with a particular uh, language or geographic region, um, on a more data rich uh, widgets. There might be uh, content recommendations, some sort of roof circulation. You may also like this. Um, what's important about these is that they're, uh, they're not something that we could uh, satisfy or even really degrade gracefully with a bunch of uh, CSS file on a CDN, uh, something where we need to handle requests back to our data centers uh, to provide um, the information to our publishers. Um, and if our, our widgets that people put on their page uh, are slow or unavailable, our customers are quite reasonably not happy. Um, and there's some brief context about sort of the, the scale that Add This operates on. Uh, tools uh, with uh, Advis's tools are on roughly 14 million different domains. Um, pages with Advis's tools on it are viewed roughly 3 billion times a day, uh, which peaks around very roughly 80,000 requests a second. Um, our sort of back end is mostly Java on Linux on physical servers, uh, so Cassandra was a really natural choice for us uh, since we had a number of engineers with expertise with Java and JVM in general, uh, knew how to you know, JSTAC, look logs, figure out what's going on, the analyzer heaped up, uh, et cetera. Um, the proverbial like PHP monolith was broken up uh, many, many years ago, uh, but we're still sort of evolving our, um, our architecture just because there's a few, uh, you know, you have a bunch of moving parts and not one big moving part doesn't mean you're done. Uh, these things continue to evolve over time. Um, and we, our engineering team is broken up into uh, individual squads with a great deal of self-direction and discretion in how they meet their product objectives. So it's really important for us that we're never in a situation where like, team A can't move forward until team B changes a schema on cluster C. We really want uh, teams to move forward and uh, not block on each other as much as possible. Uh, we've been using Cassandra uh, in production at this since 0 0.6. Uh, we have approximately a dozen clusters. Uh, we create a new one uh, per use case or SLA, uh, and that's something uh, we really like about how we're operating uh, Cassandra, because uh, having uh, multiple smaller clusters instead of one super cluster just makes it a lot easier to reason about uh, resource use, capacity planning, I'm just understanding the needs of individual teams. Uh, so I think that's a, a common practice among a number of companies using Cassandra. Uh, it's primarily used for latency-sensitive read-mostly storage. So we have a variety of back-end analytic systems. Uh, they might be chugging along and doing like business intelligence for their own sake, or they might have some machine learning application that's then going to feed data into Cassandra. Um, but in most cases, the source of data um, is from these back-end applications and not uh, uh, some sort of latency sensor, right? You have a few smaller clusters that are doing more traditional sort of like CRUD applications uh, in relationship to their uh, web server. And every cluster is multi-DC. Uh, that's something that's really important to us uh, for, about Cassandra and really any sort of data storage system that can't handle uh, multiple data centers is uh, a table stakes for us. That's not, uh, not something we can really consider using. Um, and again, uh, you know, in some cases we'll have some sort of batch system or some streaming system. It might be updating Cassandra every hour or every few minutes. Um, or more often, uh, and that's the sort of primary uh, use case that we have. Um, this is a quick, just a quick screenshot of internal dashboard that saw our clusters as of a few days ago, um, and links to a bunch of different graphs about them and how you know their capacity and how they're behaving. Um, and this is a chart that shows the size of the cluster, uh, size of each cluster in a in a single DC. Uh, so you can see we have one cluster on the size that's dramatically larger than the rest, um, and that cluster is something that's been focused a lot of uh, sort of performance attention. But we also have a lot of clusters that are they're really small, um, and that'll uh, be what we talk about in the sort of second half of the talk. Cool.
to ZFS. Uh, so first of a, a aside on abstractions, so when we talk about storage, uh, there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, there's block devices, there's partitions, there's file systems themselves, there's RAID, there's volume management. Um, so there's, there's a lot of moving parts, and they're relatively brittle with a big plant up front. Uh, usually, I would say it's not super typical to sort of change, uh, you know, add new devices to your RAID array or uh, change block sizes. Like, these are done, they can be, they're kind of a painful, they're like a sort of a special type of operation. You kind of sit down, maybe you're going to plan a little bit. Um, and because these uh, pieces are kind of arranged together in your own sort of bespoke hierarchy, <coughs> uh, the, they're not, not really talking to each other well. The file system thinks it's talking to your block device is really written. Uh, file blogging manager that's uh, talking about blocks to uh, something it thinks is a block device, but it's really a RAID array, um, sharding stuff across multiple devices that actually are block devices. Um, and generally, uh, from all this sort of complexity, the sort of data integrity story isn't great. There's not, you don't really have a great guarantee that the blocks uh, I just wrote, uh, I read, or the blocks I just wrote. Um, so it's really common applica for applications to do sort of their own checksumming and stuff like that, um, which is good. Like Cassandra does that, it has, has a little you know, checksum for each compressed block, uh, which is great. But really nice that the operating system something that can solve this problem uh, for us. And you contrast that with memory, uh, where the <coughs> sort of abstraction programmers deal with day to day is virtual memory and have for you know, several decades. Uh, they malloc and free, and really, there's no notion of like which DIM am I mallocing from, or oh no, something has to change, so we're going to send someone up to the data center to switch two DIMs. Um, that, that would be that sort of weird, doesn't make sense. Uh, you might have to worry about something like NUMA, and NUMA can be uh, really complicated, but it can mostly be construed as, as a runtime problem, right? I can decide uh, without sending someone, uh, without rearranging anything physically, that I'd like to interleave or pin things to a particular physical socket or something like that. Uh, so ZFS is a, a storage subsystem. It consumes, subsumes the sort of traditional responsibilities of a file system, RAID, and volume manager. Uh, it's always consistent um, on disk, which you need to think of as there's no FSEK, or FSEK is always running. Um, it's a universal storage system. It provides with post uh, local post file systems, block devices, NFS, uh, Samba, etc. cetera. Uh, I've been using Linux like RAID tools for uh, longer than I've been using ZFS, but I find the ZFS a uh, sort of administrative tool set much easier to work with, um, despite having not used it nearly as long. Uh, and there's he's a scalable um, data structures, so that the maximum size of a single pool is two to the 78 bit, uh, which I believe is 256 zettabytes, uh, which is very large uh, even for a Cassandra cluster. Um, it was started by Jeff Bonswick and Matthew Ahrens, its son, around 2001. So if you sort of believe the trope that a file system uh, takes at least a decade to mature and stabilize, uh, ZFS is now a, a fine wine you can enjoy. Um, it's available for you know, all sort of modern Unix operating systems. And the big idea that we're getting at is to do it for storage, uh, for vir what uh, virtual memory did for memory. Um, obviously, I mentioned you know, ZFS started at Sun. Sun, uh, well, is, is no longer with us and does not make Linux, uh, but there's been a Linux port available uh, since 2013, and it was ported to FreeBSD in 2008 or so. Uh, so there's a long history of uh, ZFS as a cross-platform um, cross uh, file system. The uh, quip about ZFS that I believe was, was made about um, uh, Andrew Moyne on the Linux kernel mailing list is that it's a rampant layering violation <laughs> because it's combining these traditional uh, responsibilities of multiple moving parts. Um, but I think instead of better way to think about it, it's just sort of re it's rearranged the parts a little bit and then uh, clarified the abstractions between them. So instead of everything thinking it's talking to a block device, even though that's a, a pathological lie, uh, instead there's a, something on top that's thinking about file names, sort of post 6 uh, file system type things. Uh, it's going to perform, it wants to perform transactions on them as objects. There's a part in the middle that takes, satisfies these transactions on objects, maps them to a virtual address space, um, and then something maps those virtual addresses to the, the physical addresses. So it's not like a, one giant thing, it's still broken out into multiple subsystems. Um, and that does allow some flexibility. Uh, for example, you can, ZFS is usually used as a normal POSIX file system running locally on the box. You can also do NFS, Samba, et cetera. You can also do, uh, expose a, do the, the trick where you expose a raw block device too, if you still want to play that game, such as for a swap partition. Um, you can also run something um, like Oracle that expects it's talking to a block device or Lustre, uh, which is a distributed, um, Fast and popular in the HPC space, and I mentioned that because the actual original impetus uh, for porting ZFS to Linux was from the Lawrence Liverpool National Laboratories. They wanted to use Lustre on top of ZFS, ZFS and Lustre for their uh, supercomputers, so they have a, a variety of presentations around that of uh, super, you have a hobby and supercomputers. 
Uh, ZFS is a copy and write file system, so blocks are never updated in place. Uh, this sort of shares a lot of similarities with the sort of log structured bridge systems that a lot of modern databases use as well. Um, so when a new uh, block is going to be written, uh, it's written somewhere, a series of pointers are updated, and th this change is not alive until the last atomic uh, pointer at the root of the tree is updated. Um, this is how ZFS uh, provides its end-to-end -end data integrity guarantees, because not only do the blocks, uh, not only does each point have a pointer to the next block, uh, but it also has a cryptographic hash of the expected contents of that block. So we always know what we read is what we originally wrote. Um, and by having, uh, just keeping track of the, uh, a different root of the tree, uh, we, uh, snapshots are a very straightforward implementation on top of ZFS. Uh, so snapshots being a read-only copy of uh, taken at a particular point in time. Um, and because, um, and compare this to something like R um, rsync, which rsync's a fantastic program, we use it in all sorts of places, it has a lot of clever algorithms, and does a really great job of um, Coordinating so the minimal amount of data is exchanged between two points on the network, which is all great. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, rsync is an O of N operation. It has to look at all of the files and see if they changed. Um, well, ZFS um, sort of RV knows um, between two points in time, these are all the changes um, that were done. So that's, that's sort of a significant advantage. Um, snapshots can also be promoted to a rewrite clone. Um, you only, again, you only put the difference um, in accumulated changes. Um, so final sort of like architectural bit about ZFS. Um, so you can give ZFS all hard disks. You can also give ZFS all SSDs, and this will make your life better. In all the general ways that giving using S, uh, SSDs instead of uh, error prone rotational media makes your life better. Uh, but that's not necessarily economical. You know, SSDs are still uh, cheaper per IOP, while uh, rotational media is still cheaper per gigabyte. Uh, so a hybrid solution can be more economical. Uh, so ZFS supports both uh, using an SSD as a read, a read cache and a non-volatile RAM or an SSD as a, a write log device. And that, so that, for example, would be very similar to what a hardware read controller might do uh, with this um, onboard non-volatile uh, RAM. So there, there are a variety of other features uh, of ZFS that are really cool. Um, if you're administrating it in a university setting and you want to give like each user their own data set on their own home directory, um, but for purposes of Cassandra, can mostly uh, pass that by for now. Uh, I try to keep the terminology relatively generic, and there's no like vocabulary quiz at the end. Uh, but this is sort of the sort of the basic ZFS vocabulary. So if I say something and it doesn't quite make sense, this uh, hopefully will help. Uh, so with ZFS, we're creating a storage pool that's supposed to be uh, my abstract collection of resources. That, that pool is made out of devices. There's can either be physical hard disks, um, SSDs, or um, Combi uh, multiple devices combined together in some way, such as uh, mirrored pairs, um, like RAID 1 or RAID 10 or like a, a RAID 5 style stripe. Uh, data sets are the things. Go ahead. Can these devices also be uh, stuff like the cloud disks? Um, I mean, anything that is exposed to your OS as a, a block device, or if you're doing something locally like iSCSI or something, could potentially um, be used for that. Uh, local storage is more common, just so it sort of is more common in general. Um, data sets are uh, the things we're going to create in the storage pool. They're you know, usually file systems in the, for the purpose of the rest of the stock. You just think of them as file systems. Uh, they're configured with, with key value pairs by property. So you can do something like ZFS, you know, enable compression, or ZFS get, what is my compression ratio? Um, and then ZFS doesn't use the um, normal operating system's page cache. It has its own adaptive replacement cache um, called the ARC. Um, and for me as an operator, the ARC was one of the, the nicest and most pleasant things about switching to ZFS. Because uh, if I have a cache, the things I care about the most are how large are it, how many resources am I dedicating to this. In the case of a, an operating system cache, uh, it's probably a lot. Um, but then I want to know how effective is it? What is the hit rate I'm actually getting? Uh, and for the Linux page cache, this data is generally um, difficult to get right, uh, only with sort of the, the latest the dynamic tracing tools. Is that something you can sort of um, get a hit rate out of? Which is it's great that Linux is uh, on the latest kernels is now having uh, more mature dynamic tracing tools. Uh, but it's not really nice if you just look at proc and get your answer. Um, so this is an example. Uh, so we get all the stats are sort of in slash proc slash something something arc. Um, arc stat is sort of a traditional tool that's it's specific for the arc, and I'm putting out a bunch of stats, and you can you know let it fill up your terminal and you know, sort of your traditional Unixy looking thing. Uh, this is an example of two different uh, workloads. One was about one a few k requests per second, uh, getting about a 50 percent hit rate, and the other with about 400 k requests per second, getting a near 100 percent hit rate. Uh, so obviously these are very, very different uh, workloads. One is probably much more sequential, uh, while the other is, is perhaps uniformly random. 
Uh, you can also, uh, you know, since they're just stats and a uh, bunch of things in PROC, you can pipe them to Gangly or CollectD, whatever monitoring tools you use quite easily. Uh, the integration may already be there. DStat has a plugin if you like uh, pretty color terminals as well. You can kind of put that next to all of your, all the other stats you're used to looking at. Um, uh, and the final point about the, the, the ARC, uh, sort of the memory management there, is that ZFS uh, supports uh, prefetch in both uh, row major and column major order. So it can handle the really simple case of I'm sequentially scanning through a file, it can handle the case of I'm sequentially scanning through a bunch of different files in parallel, or I'm scanning through, but I'm not doing a total sequential scan, I'm reading a block and then reading every nth block after that sort of prefetch. Uh, the next block without uh, you know, wasting time fetching all the blocks in between. Uh, so, for example, for Cassandra, we did a test where we had one node, and the two nodes in the same cluster uh, in production. One node was using the traditional node's page cache, the other was using the ARC. Uh, and then we catted a bunch of junk, um, you know, several gigabytes of junk to DevNull. Uh, for the page cache node, the 90th percentile uh, latency jumped by 4 to 6x, uh, which is bad. That would be a lot. Uh, for the ARC, the uh, latency jumped by 2x, uh, which isn't great. I think there's definitely still room for improvement there, uh, but that's uh, you know, dramatically better than what we were seeing. Uh, the Linux page cache, and you know modern storage systems like Cassandra, you know they use log structure and merge trees, compaction, repair. These are common operations that are happening all the time, mm -hmm. and a common area of performance concern. Mm -hmm. so I think this is uh, you know, more relevant now than, than ever. Uh, again, I, I mentioned at least uh, subjectively for me, I find the administrative commands really easy to use compared to sort of like Linux uh, NVRAM stuff. Uh, Zpool creates storage pools. ZFS creates uh, data sets, file systems on top of that. Uh, there's a third command for debugging information that does really focus at like kernel <coughs> development, not not something like you need to use to debug your pool. Um, a production esque example: we're going to use zpool create. We're going to call a pool tank because that's the same pun people have been using for the past decade. Uh, we're going to use two mirrored pairs, uh, kind of like array ten. SDF is an SSD, so we're going to use that as a cache device. Uh, we're going to create a file system on top of that. It's going to be for our SS tables for Cassandra. Uh, we're going to mount uh, that data set somewhere convenient for Cassandra. We're going to enable compression, because LZ4 is really cheap, so why not? We're going to turn off A time, really common sort of performance uh, tuning setting, whether it's uh, AFC4, XFS, or ZFS. And we're going to churn for Cassandra, and then Cassandra can go ahead and, and run, uh, putting its uh, SS tables there. We can use ZFS list to list all the, the data sets we just created. And we can do something like ZFS get, to see what the compression ratio is. Um, I would say 1.08x uh, is, is typical of what we've seen if we enable both the ZFS with compression uh, and Cassandra's built-in block compression on um, uh, production workloads and synthetic workloads. Obviously, that, that number can get driven up a lot higher. Um, so again, so specific to, to Linux, because that's what I think most people in this, you know, in this room run. Uh, a long time ago, if you Google, you might end up at like some old file system and user space port. Um, but that's, uh, that's not, there's now a native port, and that's the one I've been talking about, and that's the one everyone is using now. It was started by Lawrence Liverpool National Laboratories for their uh, Sequoia supercomputer. Uh, since 2013, it's been generally available. Um, if you had it run on your, on your laptop or production or anything else like that. Uh, and since about 2014, the sort of cross operating system development has really picked up. Uh, and I think to a really, uh, to me, impressive degree, to the amount of coordination between Lumos, BSD, and Linux um, is really good to see. Because uh, I think that's relatively where I, uh, unusual. I wish these people talked to each other more so we could get more cross pollination. Uh, the latest version is 0.65, released this month. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of distribution. It's at this point, uh, it's been packaged for just about every Linux distribution uh, you can care to run. Uh, there's an active unit, uh, user community. You can get help uh, in, on Freenode or on a mailing list. Uh, there's obviously lots of docs going back um, a long time, and most of the docs that explain administration, um, you know, or on the most of FreeBSD are, are, are you know, similarly applicable. You probably noticed that the um, Version number there start with a zero, uh, which should rightfully right, really give you some trepidation about files if you're going to run in production, uh, even for something like Cassandra, which has its own built-in um, replication. This blog post is sort of the canonical and best summary of the current state. Um, the first, like a five-part series, it'll go into a lot of details about sort of corner cases and caveats um, and history, so you can uh, you know, make the decision for yourself. Uh, the summary is all the sort of basic uh, integrity features, all the things I would like for a file system to basically work, meaning it does not lose my data. They're all there. They all work the same like they do in other production systems. Uh, I have for some time, that that code hasn't changed. Uh, the major area of, of friction is sort of pro workload uh, performance, and in particular, the interaction between ZFS's memory management and Linux's uh, memory management. 
uh, at this point is not, um, not always in three, for example, if you type three, uh, it'll not necessarily incorrectly account for all of the zero bases of memory is used instead of uh, plus or minus buffer cache as it usually would be. Um, same for sort of other tools that are used to looking at um, slash proc to figure out how the memory is being used. Uh, so this is probably very general, probably applies to just about everything. Uh, there might not be better, it's probably not better at everything, um, but it might be a really good fit for some of your use cases today. Cool. Scaling up. This is sort of the initial problem we were facing. We had a large-ish Cassandra cluster. It was large for us. Uh, so we had machine learning derived data about URLs using AdBus. So there is this URL about uh, automotives or cooking or Cassandra. Um, we had an internal SLA we were trying to hit of around uh, 35 milliseconds at the 98th percentile. Um, fortunately, this was, uh, or unfortunately, fortunately, depending on your point of view, this was a really successful internal service. It was going to drive a lot of products. Those products were either uh, failing to meet their SLAs or um, uh, just launch, you're not even able to launch them yet because the performance of the cluster is unsatisfactory. And despite adding additional, you know, doing several rounds of trying to you know, just add a little more hardware and see if it gets better, um, we really weren't getting in any situation we saw was sort of an economical uh, situation. We could you know, perhaps literally uh, put ourselves out of business, but we were not going to make the, the cluster work well. Um, and again, this uh, so being URLs, it kind of followed a sort of standard looking web traffic pattern uh, where there's, you know, there are some very uh, hot URLs. Uh, but there's also a very, very long tail of activity on the web. Um, so DFS had this uh, level two arc thing, so we wanted to try that out. And again, how that works if, is if a read request comes in, if it's in memory, great. You can you know, satisfy the read request, everything's good. If not, we'll check if it's on the SSD. Uh, if so, great, we can read it to the SSD and return it. Um, that was you know, not as fast as memory, but still pretty fast. Uh, but if that's a miss as well, then we have to go down to the rotational media. Uh, this is implemented as uh, a ring buffer, which has some uh, nice um, operational properties, uh, namely that there's certain threads that are looking at the end of the most frequently used list to say, hey, this thing's about to fall off. I'm going to write to the SSD now, because since it was in the arc to begin with, it's probably a pretty useful thing to keep around. Uh, but since that's an asynchronous process, there's no situation where like, there's a firmware bug in your SSD, or your SSD like, breaks. Uh, or you just need to evict a lot of memory really quickly, there's no situation where being unable to write to the SSD will have any impact um, on sort of the normal operations of the system. Your performance might get a lot worse, but there's no like deadlock or something like that you have to worry about. So that was uh, really nice for us to um, give us some comfort as we were going into it. Uh, and again, creating it is really straightforward. Uh, you just you know, add one more line that says this thing, this block device, make it a cache. Um, and you're, you know, more or less starts working right away. Uh, I apologize that these graphs are a little hard to read uh, with their uh, ugly colors and whatnot. These are all like, sort of real production graphs I took while I was working on these slides last week. Um, so this cluster is getting roughly uh, 25,000 requests a second in one DC. Uh, the Cassandra row cache has about a 70% hit rate. The ARC has about a 60% hit rate. And then the level two ARC with the SSD has about a 90% hit rate. Uh, so, so those three caches together um, combined, those 25,000 requests a second uh, turn into less than 100 um, uh, requests to uh, rotational media per node. Uh, so ever the, so the vast majority of requests from memory, used, or through memory or an, through an SSD, um, which obviously is you know, really good for, much better for performance at the 90th percentile. Uh, so that the pithy result, or we were able to, to quote, so we got twice the performance of uh, half the physical nodes. We went from not meeting our SLAs to exceeding our SLAs uh, in order to reduce the um, you know, number of nodes even needed in the cluster. Uh, your mileage will obviously vary between your workload, uh, what is your ratio of DRAM to SSD that you have available, what is sort of the working set size, and what is sort of the distribution of requests. But for us, um, this particular request, which I think is you know, web-ish looking traffic, is a fairly common uh, use case for Cassandra, uh, it worked out really well. So this is not that big cluster. This is a different cluster. Um, it has uh, three nodes, uh, and it has about 150 megabytes per data. So this isn't big note data. This isn't like medium data. Uh, this would fit on a CD-ROM drive. I think this would fit on a zip drive, if anyone still has a zip drive. Uh, and since it's replicated three ways, this isn't even like 150 data, megabytes of data per node. This is like 150 megabytes of data. Uh, so this is not an exciting amount of data at all from the quantity perspective. Uh, but this is actually tremendously important data to us. Um, it's user configuration data. Uh, it has among the highest uh, latency requirements um, that we have. And so um, getting at it, access to it is, is really important. 
Um, and again, we have a number of clusters. Some of them are really latency smaller clusters, some which, uh, like this one, do have significant latency requirements. Um, so what we wanted to do was we had all these clusters. Uh, they were pretty small. They were you know, three nodes per DC, and we had two DCs. Uh, so that's six physical nodes to store like 150 megabytes of data, which is uh, gallingly inefficient. Um, they were, but again, they're among some of our most uh, latency sensitive surfaces, so just kind of stick them in a, uh, a corner on some hardware VMs uh, did not seem like a good, good solution to go down. At the time, we had some relatively complicated networking requirements, so it was really important to just, uh, for Cassandra's sake, to just you know, give it an IP normally and not do uh, some sort of crazy uh, port mapping or IP table scripting or something like that. Uh, we didn't want to complicate the stack in that way. Uh, we wanted to be transparent to the application. We didn't want us to you know, rewrite Cassandra or have, or sort of worse, have two like totally disparate ways of managing Cassandra um, to achieve this better multi-tenancy. And we wanted to be relatively transparent to the rest of our infrastructure, including <coughs> like uh, uh, DNS, uh, DHCP, inventory, configuration management, monitoring, et cetera. We, uh, step zero was uh, solve all outstanding problems uh, with monitoring uh, ephemeral containers, um, uh, networking and storage, uh, that would sort of not uh, not work out, not be a, a product of a reasonable level of effort. Um, so this is, uh, you know, containers obviously are a hot, hot topic as of late. This is uh, on one arbitrary access. And on one hand, you might have your uh, sadly compiled Go binary. Uh, it's a sweet microservice talking to your service discovery framework. And it's just, you know, you spin it up and it runs in like 20 nodes. You don't really know where they run. You're just having a great time. Uh, and super minimal, maybe it's like slash bin, my Go binary. Uh, config file, and then it's like libc, and that's it, and that's really sweet. Uh, on the other hand, you might have uh, other extremes, something that looks you know, like a normal, like Unix uh, server or workstation, and kind of how that's looked for the past few decades. Uh, as, you know, original purpose, all sort of existing tooling, understanding, understands how it works, um, et cetera. Give these things names. Uh, you might call the stuff, on one hand, your application containers. You might call the other systems or infrastructure containers, because you know, they look more like a traditional uh, you know, Unix operating system that, you know, uh, we've all known and love. And you have these like really concrete implementations. Uh, Docker is in particular, there's a lot of excitement about that, and using that for application containers. Um, well, the LXC project has been around for a long time uh, and does a good job of just giving you a thing that looks uh, like a normal Unix uh, station. So there's no notion of like sort of I need to containerize my app. You know, container is a noun and it's the thing that's containing my application. Uh, and this is, I think we as an industry are still kind of figuring out, you know, what are these container things? How are we going to use them? How can we use them to improve our architecture? What are the consequences for service discovery, monitoring, alerting, et cetera? Uh, right, so this, there can, you know, people are doing all sorts of interesting things. You know, right? You're taking, you don't have a micro uh, group service, but you've shoved your entire LAMP stack into one Docker container. Um, so again, so we wanted like persistent local storage and not some sort of uh, uh, you know, ephemeral things uh, suitable for uh, you know, a stateless microservice. Uh, ZRest was a really natural fit because the problems we wanted to solve, like I want to create a, something from a base image, I want it to have local storage that you know uh, is persistent, I want to you know, really easily backup running applications, potentially migrate containers between hosts uh, without losing data. I want to manage quotas so that one uh, container cannot consume all of the storage resources on one host. Um, I'll have really natural ZFS. This, you know, Z, this is ZFS flow. This is ZFS snapshot. Send receive uh, ZFS properties, um, etc. And I should point out, this isn't like some like crazy like epiphany we had. This is how FreeBSD and Lumos and other um, systems have been you know working uh, for years and for everything from public clouds to, to <coughs> trading on Wall Street. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, LXC already had uh, ZFS support. It's kind of buried in like the man page. It's like somewhere in the bottom of the man page of LXC-create. There's like what backing store do you want? It has this long list of uh, LVM and just a flat directory or best whatever that is. Um, uh, anyway, so ZFS is one of those options, and it basically just sort of worked out of the box, which was really nice. Uh, so what we did was we, uh, given these sort of constraints uh, and our sort of uh, need for uh, transparency, because we wanted to change you know, one thing and see how that worked, not change everything and hope, at the same time, and hope it worked out. So we wrote a bunch of uh, glue code, so, the, so these commands, just like a few hundred lines of Python, there's nothing terribly technically exciting there. Uh, but an operator can do something like build a container, build a container um, with it, this many resources, please put it over here. Uh, add these chef rolls uh, or to it, uh, and then once that's all, all set, looks good. Uh, you know, set it to allocated. Uh, you know, it's sort of in a production state, and the monitoring or all the existing monitoring tools can go find it, um, monitor it, and you know, record on you know, alert if it breaks. Um, so, you know, so again, this was just sort of transparent for you know, Chef and Gangly and DNS. 
uh, et cetera, and it's really building on top of um, all of the facilities provided by ZFS and LXC. Um, we did uh, introduce C Advisor, which is a tool from Google for monitoring containers. Um, and I would uh, encourage you if you're using LXC or Docker or just anything else with C groups to so check out C Advisor because um, it's, it's really handy. Um, this is a uh, proof by screenshot. Uh, so this is listing all of the containers on our host. Um, they're all given you know, unique IDs, and these map uh, one to one to ZFS data sets. Um, at the time, this is early uh, 2014, or early this year, rather. Um, uh, we had not yet exhausted our patients for shipping container puns, so the, the sort of base image is called a dry dock. Uh, that's, that's entirely my fault. Um, but you can see it, it's, it's, you know, it's not a minimal thing. It's a relatively fast, like 700 megabyte CentOS um, image, but that's 700 megabytes that is uh, not counted against the individual containers. <coughs> These are just a few quick uh, series of screenshots from C Advisor for a particular container in production. Uh, so Cassandra nodes given uh, six cores, or you know, six shares of CPU, uh, six virtual shares of CPU, rather. Uh, it's a lot of all the cores that's not pinned everywhere. It has about six gigabytes of memory. It's uh, and, uh, doing some, doing, computing some stuff. Uh, it's using about uh, 4.7 of its uh, allotted six gigabytes of memory. Cool, so sort of the results from that uh, was we got approximately uh, 2x consolidation. Um, by you know, putting multiple containers on the same physical host. Uh, we were able to, do that combined with some other significant internal projects was enough to defer a hardware purchase for almost a year, um, which is a you know, really significant uh, bottom line value to, uh, for the company. Uh, we got our clean method uh, for having multiple Cassandra clusters uh, being multi tenant on the same host. Uh, we continue to break them apart um, for, by SLA or use case and aren't bound by um, some sort of arbitrary restriction. Uh, at this point, uh, every viewer of Advis's tools uh, involves a request to Cassandra, usually in a container and already is on top of ZFS. Um, so in the future, uh, this sort of continued performance support for that largest cluster, you know, you know, all of them effectively would like performance to be better. Uh, particularly, the hot topic as of late is the alignment of blocks for reads, or the lack thereof. Um, and also, so we wrote a few hundred lines of blue code, that's great, solved a bunch of problems, everyone's happy. But we're going like, to keep this going and write our own infrastructure as a service. Uh, is there something else we should adopt instead? Um, that's kind of a, an open question we have to solve. Um, if working on uh, Cassandra, uh, administering is of interest to in you, uh, we're hiring really quickly to work on Cassandra um, and, and our clusters, making sure the best way uh, storage uh, solution for um, our engineering teams. Otherwise, are there any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, how did you organize the commit log and, and data partitions? Using ZFS and Cassandra. Sure. In this case, we just put. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, the question was, how do we uh, organize the commit log and data partitions? Did we put them in, you know, separate pools, for example? Um, the answer is no. Uh, we just left it all in the same pool. For most of these uh, smaller clusters that we're using it for, uh, since right, they don't have a, a, a huge amount of data or a particularly large uh, rate of writes, um, we, we felt that was okay. Good. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you have any issues with like uh, fragmentation? of uh, ZFS, since it doesn't uh, really fragment itself. Uh, you're talking about like storage fragmentation or, or memory storage, fragmentation? Storage fragmentation, yeah. No, so the question was about other issues with uh, fragmentation of storage you run into with ZFS, because there's no like uh, Win32 style like defrag utility. <coughs> um, the answer is no. I believe the sort of the, the stand, uh, not that we have run into, I believe the standard answer was is about roughly 80% full. Uh, you should definitely be on the watch out for those issues. Uh, and obviously, sort of a uh, uh, active area of research is how can we move that 80 to be 81%, 85, 90, et cetera. Um, but none of our <coughs> very few of our tools are that full at this time. Yep. Uh, did you benchmark a, a better FS? Um, so there, there are, we didn't look at better. So for like my entire uh, technical career, uh, better FS has been like almost ready. Uh, <laughs> and I have great hair now, uh, perhaps, perhaps I'm rating for better FS. Uh, so I haven't used it in production. I can't really comment on it uh, technically. We did look briefly at Bcache and Flashcache. The, it, Linux being Linux, there's like six dozen, uh, half dozen um, other sort of like using SSD as a cache type solutions. Um, but since DFS uh, had a bunch of other desirable properties and was surprisingly easy to use, um, we went. We didn't look at them too seriously. We just went with this. Uh, did you say that you turned off the compression in uh, Cassandra? With uh, and use the ZFS compression right now. Uh, so the question is, are we using uh, ZFS compression, Cassandra's block compression, or both? Uh, the answer is right now we're using both. Um, 
the thinking being, well, you know, a few more percent of compression that's effectively free from you know, LZ4 being so cheap um, sounds great. Uh, we can compress your index file, so that's how we're getting that like uh, eight percent or whatever boost. Uh, I think that's something we're, we're sort of reevaluating in the future because um, it, it sort of complicates a lot thinking about do how much overread am I going to get because no one really knows how many things I'm reading because CFS, you know, Cassandra says I want to read this the block that I think is this big, and then it's actually compressed, and then you know, you know, trying to read your your eight eight kilobyte block might end up reading like 128 kilobytes of messed data. Mm -hmm. Did your organization have issue with the ZFS CDDL license running on Linux GPL license? Uh, no, so the question is about licensing, specifically um, you know, Linux is, is famously under the GPL v2 only, uh, while ZFS is under the, the Cuddle. Um, I the, for specifically our organization, no, we didn't have any problems with that. Uh, I believe there's an extensive like uh, question and answer section on ZFS uh, on Linux.org's website. Uh, I think the short summary is if you're not distribute like many things, if you're not a uh, distributor of uh, compiled binaries, um, you're fine. Uh, if you want to sell like a, a vendor product where you're going to compile the two together, uh, you should probably you know, talk to your lawyers more. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. I will be around for questions for the rest of the day.